Okay, well, welcome to lecture six. Uh, this is our third uh, focus on lecture, and uh, I'm going to be talking about Lewis uh, in today's lecture. Um, as usual, I'm having some difficulty. Ah, oh, there we are. So let me, as usual, start with a recap. So last time we looked at the thesis of Revelation uh, in some detail, focusing on four questions about it. Is it true? Is it incompatible with physicalism? Is it presupposed in philosophical thinking about the mind-body problem? Is it presupposed in ordinary thinking? And we also distinguished Revelation from a weaker thesis called partial revelation. Uh, and that's, as I said, a weaker and more plausible view. Um, not to say that it's true, you could still deny it, but nevertheless much more plausible than revelation. And we criticized a bridge principle due to Philip Goff about the relationship between those two theses. Well, today I want to look at what's perhaps the most famous paper defending revelation, which is David Lewis's paper called Should a Materialist believe in qualia. It's one of those papers which is very short, but um, a remarkably rich paper. Um, now, oh. So let's think of Lewis's, we can think of Lewis's paper, if you like, as um, in, in the same way that we thought about Revelation last time. So last time, as I said, we thought of four questions and we can sort of get at the main points in Lewis's paper by thinking about those four questions, and in particular by seeing how um, how uh, his answers to these questions contrasts with the answers I was talking about last time. So the first question was, is revelation true? Well, Lewis thinks the answer to that is no. So in that sense, he's like me last time, who I also argued that the answer to that is no. Question two, is it incompatible with physicalism? Lewis says, yes, it is incompatible. Uh, and likewise, I agree with that. Um, physical, uh, revelation and physicalism are incompatible, at least if by physicalism you mean the identity physicalism that uh, I was talking about last time, and in fact Lewis assumes in his paper. Um, actually, Lewis thinks that revelation is false, so the answer to question one is no, uh, because it's incompatible with physicalism. He thinks physicalism is true, and um, since physicalism is true and they're incompatible, therefore revelation is false. Um, I didn't use that argument. I gave an independent argument for thinking that revelation was false. Um, but uh, that's not the reason that Lewis gives. Lewis gives the reason that physicalism is true, so therefore revelation is false. Question three, is revelation presupposed in philosophical thought about the mind-body problem? Well, here we get some divergences. Lewis thinks the answer to that is yes, it is presupposed in philosophical thought. And in, in fact, importantly so, I think, uh, is the sort of underlying assumption in Lewis's paper that revelation plays a kind of crucial role in the arguments against physicalism. I don't think, as I was explaining last time, that's true. I don't see that revelation is presupposed in those arguments. Question four, is it presupposed in ordinary thought about the mind-body problem? Lewis again says the answer to that is yes, it is presupposed, and that's because he thinks, as we'll see, that it's part of folk psychology, part of our ordinary ways of thinking about the psychological states of ourselves and of other people. Whereas for my part, I think the answer about whether, as to the question about whether revelation is presupposed in ordinary thought, I think the answer is, well, maybe, it's difficult, probably not. Um, it's certainly a difficult empirical question, uh, not least difficult because of the difficulty of um, identifying clearly what revelation is and distinguishing it from various other theses. So Lewis's pattern of answers is for these four questions, no, yes, yes, yes. Me, it's no, yes, no, and maybe. Um, now, when thinking about this, uh, Lewis, the first thing to say is that Lewis doesn't quite call the thesis under discussion in the paper revelation, though he does use that word 
in other contexts for very similar theses about color, uh, in particular in the paper no, uh, Naming the Colors. But here he uses the phrase identification thesis. And uh, this is the way he uh, capture, captures it. The idea behind, I should say that the idea behind the um, uh, uh, identification thesis is he thinks that when you're in a conscious state you can identify the state. To identify the state in Lewis's terminology means effectively to know the essence of the state. That's why it's called an identification thesis. But in any case this is the way that he introduces the thesis in his paper. According to the identification thesis, the knowledge I gain by having an experience with quale Q enables me to know what Q is, identifies Q. In this sense, any possibility not ruled out by the content of my knowledge is one in which it is Q, and not other, any other property instead that is the quale of my experience. Equivalent, equivalently, when I have an experience with qual AQ, the knowledge I thereby gain reveals the essence of Q, a property of Q such that necessarily Q has it and nothing else does. Well, there's a lot of things going on in a passage like this, and so we need to be a bit careful. So one, one thing that's going on in this passage is that Lewis... Um, talks about ruling out or ruling in possibilities and he also talks about the essence. So if we go back to the passage he says um, the knowledge I gain by having an experience with qual AQ enables me to know what Q is, identifies it, so you know what it is in this sense. Um, any possibility not ruled out by the content of my knowledge is one in which it is Q and not any other property instead that is the quale of my experience. That's, uh, the, that's the sense in which my knowledge identifies Q. And then he says, equivalently, when I have an experience with quale Q, the knowledge I thereby gain reveals the essence of Q. Now, so he says that, sorry, so he says that this idea about ruling out possibilities and the idea about knowing the essence are equivalent. And in that case, I'm going to just ignore this business about ruling out possibilities in our discussion. And that's partly because I think this idea of knowing the essence is more intuitive. And it's also the one that we used last time. Um, and it's the one that other philosophers have used as well. So I'm just going to focus on the, the, the bit that says, when I have an experience with qual IQ, the knowledge I thereby gain reveals the essence of Q. Lewis also, in the end of the passage, gives an account of what the essence of Q is, a property of Q such that necessarily Q has it and nothing else does. Um, that's a particular proposal about what the essence of Q is. Last time I was saying that the essence of something is just the totality of its essential properties, leaving vague what essential properties amounts to, or not vague exactly, but leaving undiscussed what essential properties amounts to. Here Lewis gives an account of what that is, but again, I don't think we can. We need to worry too much about that account. Uh, we can um, um, uh, just operate with an intuitive understanding of essence. So let's set aside the, the bit at the end about um, uh, the account of what an essence is, and let's set aside the element that where Lewis is talking about any possibility not ruled out by the content. In order to understand that notion of any possibility not ruled out, you have to be um, pretty deeply into the weeds uh, in, with uh, Lewis's way of thinking about psychological states and about knowledge, but it won't matter for our purposes. Um, so that's one interpretive issue that arises with the passage. There's another uh, interpretive issue having to do with the, the distinction between the bit where Lewis talks about enabling and the bit where he talks about thereby. So let me explain that. According to the identification thesis, Lewis says, the knowledge I gain by having an experience with qual AQ enables me to know what Q is. And at the end of the passage, he says, the knowledge, uh, when I have an experience with qual AQ, the knowledge I thereby gain reveals the essence of Q. Uh, 
On the face of it, uh, the idea that having an experience enables me to know something seems to be much weaker from the idea that the experience that uh, when I have an experience of a certain kind, the knowledge I thereby gain, thereby suggests that the knowledge immediately happens consequently on having the experience, whereas enables suggests much something much weaker, namely that you have the experience and then you could come to know. I think this is related actually to the issues about interpret interpreting the thesis of revelation that we looked at last time. We can begin with, if you remember, I went through uh, different interpretations of the thesis, beginning with the very simple one that just says, if you're in, when you have the experience, you know, uh, you know the essence of the experience, and then adding um, weakenings to that to make it much more plausible. But that, that issue doesn't seem to be resolved exactly, at least in this passage from Lewis. And then another element that's hard to interpret from Lewis's passage is that he's talking about um, having an experience with quale Q, where qualia, he talks, he talks throughout, not in just in the title of the paper, but in the paper itself, of the qualia of his experiences. So he distinguishes between an experience and some property of that experience, which he calls a quale. Um, and um, that, that is somewhat different from the sort of kind of logical framework that, that I've, I've been talking about. I've just been talking about people's being in conscious states. Whereas here Lewis is talking about as if there was a thing called an experience that you can be in or have and that, that that experience has some property. Um, uh, by an experience here, he means really an event of um, usually a, some sort of perceptual or sensory event. So for example, the onset or persistence of some perceptual state, seeing a bottle or seeing a bottle over some period, they would count as experiences in, um, in Lewis's sense here. And the quale is the is the sort of property of that experience. He says in the paper actually that he wants to distinguish between experiences understood as individual events, things that happen at a particular time and are not repeated. He wants to contrast that with uh, types of experience or um, experiential states, as he also puts them, which are things that um, um, different people at different times could be in. They could be in different experiential states. Experiential states are very close to the notion of a conscious state, which I've been using throughout. And he notices that, uh, he says in the paper, sorry, that um, actually if you've got the notion of an experiential state or of a type of experience, you probably don't need the notion of qual AQ anyway. Um, so, uh, this reference to qualia and experiences having qualia, I think is something that we can kind of look past in, um, in, in this paper by Lewis. This, th 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 those notions, while they're obviously central to the presentation, I think don't play a crucial role in the substance of the issue. Actually, um, the paper that I'm going to look at in lecture eight by Martina Niederrumelin makes some points that are sort of analogous to this. She thinks that illusionists in philosophy of mind um, uh, think about experience in the wrong way. They think about them actually not dissimilar in a certain sense to the way that Lewis is thinking about experiences here. But we won't need to take that up for the moment. So if we, so as I mentioned, a passage like the one that I've just been looking at raises quite a lot of interpretive questions. And there's an enormous amount going on kind of in the background. Um, but I think if we look past these, which I think it's permissible to do, then we can take Lewis to intend the thesis of revelation, uh, somewhat in the sense that we form, ba basically in the way that we formulated it uh, in the previous lecture. And that was as follows. Revelation says that necessarily, if you're in a conscious state C, that would be the same in Lewis's terminology as being in an experiential state. If you're in a conscious state C, then you'll know that C is F, where F is in fact the essence of C. Um, again, so long as you are psychologically capable of believing that C is F, and so long as you are rational. So here the idea is that if you're in a, if you're in a conscious state, that will, to take 
Lewis's, to use Lewis's words, will enable you to know the essence, will enable you to know that CSF means you will know that CSF given certain conditions, and these are the conditions. So let's take Lewis to be asserting, uh, to be talking about, not asserting, but talking about that thesis, uh, just as the one, the, the thesis that he's talking about, I think, is equivalent to this particular thesis. Okay, so that's the thesis. Now, Lewis um, doesn't say that revelation, a.k.a. the identification thesis, but we'll talk about revelation. He doesn't say that it's true. He's not defending it in the sense that he thinks it's true. It's rather he thinks it's, as he says, built into folk psychology. So it's true according to folk psychology. Folk psychology says that it's true, but it doesn't follow that it, that it is true. It's like saying that you know, the National Enquirer says that something is true. It doesn't follow that it is true. So here Lewis says that um, it's built into folk psychology. It's part of what folk psychology says about the world, uh, but that doesn't make it true. Now, what does Lewis mean by folk psychology? Well, this is a notion that you f find a lot in Lewis's philosophy of mind. And what he, has, what he means, I think, is the idea of a tacit or unconscious system of information or system of knowledge or belief um, about the psychology and actions of other people or people in general, um, including ourselves, not just other people, actually. Um, and uh, that this sort of idea that we have a sort of tacit system of belief or information about certain domains, certain subject matters, is a sort of common idea in philosophy and in psychology. So according to many psychologists and philosophers, there are analogous systems about other domains as well, say folk biology or folk physics, folk morality, folk mathematics. The idea is that we have a tacit or unconscious way of um, conceptualizing and uh, understanding these different domains. So what Lewis has in mind is in the case of folk psychology, we, that's just a sort of tacit or unconscious system of information about a certain domain, namely the psychological states and actions of, um, of both ourselves and other people. In what sense are these systems tacit or unconscious? Well, I think by tacit, where he just really means unconscious, and by unconscious here, I think he means unconscious um, in the access sense and in the higher order sense. So um, um, if you remember from lecture one, I, just, I pointed out that there was a number of different notions of consciousness and unconsciousness uh, in consequence. One is the sort of phenomenal notion. The phenomenal notion appears, I think, in Lewis's paper under the, under the title Experience. But uh, we can also think of, an, uh, of a state being access conscious, which means it's, uh, it's poised to play a particular role, or perhaps it's that we can attend easily to the content of the state or something of that sort. Um, and a state can also be conscious in the higher order sense, in the sense that if you're in it, then you believe that you're in it, or at least believe in a certain way that you're in it. Um, now, the idea is that we have a, a body of belief about psychology here, or by a system of information, we mean a, a sort of system of, of belief, effectively, about the psychology and of, uh, of people around us and ourselves too, but that this is tacit in the sense that it's unconscious. Uh, it's not access conscious, and it's not uh, conscious in the higher order sense. We don't, for example, have... Um, necessarily have introspective access to these things and we certainly can't articulate uh, in language for example um, what these what what our folk psychological systems are as indeed what our other systems are now if you think of folk psychology in this way then there are obviously many different questions that you can ask about it one is what the content of folk psychology is so what exactly does it say about the psychology of ourselves and other people Likewise, what does folk biology say about the distinctive characteristics of animals or plants, for example? Or what does folk physics say about ordinary physical objects and the way that they behave? So what's the content? Secondly, how is the content organized? So, for example, do we think of folk psychology 
as having some very basic principles that generate other principles, or is it, uh, or is it not like that? Uh, what, what, what is treated as essential to certain mental states rather than accidental to certain mental states and so forth? That's the question of how the content is organized. Third question is how the content is realized in the mind or the brain, for example. If people are in these sort of psychological states, then there must be something about their, um, their, their brains, their intrinsic features that permit this to happen. And one might say, well, how exactly does that work? What are, if you'd like, the, the, is there some sort of system of representation or perhaps a computational system or a neural system uh, that, they're, that, that, that is the, the ground of their knowledge, of the, their knowledge of folk psychology in that sense? Um, and how does that work? That's the question of how folk psychology is realized in the mind or the brain. A fourth question might be how folk psychology develops in childhood, for example. Um, and a fifth one might be to what extent, if at all, is folk psychology a cultural or psychological universal? Does, do, does everybody um, arrive at a certain kind of folk psychological system in the same way, or is it very culturally specific? Uh, or what, or perhaps there are variations on cultural, on folk psychology. Now Lewis himself uh, isn't really interested in these last questions. He's mainly interested in the first of the questions, namely what the content of folk psychology is. And this is where the, the notion of folk psychology and the idea that um, um, the identification thesis is built, is built into folk psychology emerges. So here's the connection between folk psychology and revelation. So his idea, if you like, is that it's part of the content of folk psychology that the identification thesis is true. So the content of folk psychology includes the idea that if you're in a mental state, if sorry, if you're in a conscious state and these background conditions attain, then you'll know the essence of the state. That's supposed to be built into folk psychology, meaning that it's it's part of the content of folk psychology. Perhaps the notion of built-in actually means something abutting the second question about how the content is organized because it suggests that uh, it's somehow central to folk psychology. Um, uh, but in any case, the crucial point is that it's, it's part of the content of folk psychology. Now, revelation or the identification thesis isn't the only thesis about experience or consciousness that is built into folk psychology, according to Lewis. In fact, if you look at his work in philosophy of mind, you can find a whole bunch of theses that he thinks would be built into folk psychology. So a very obvious one you might call the causal thesis, which might, which, which might go like this. When you have an experience, you're in some inner state which typically causes you to behave in certain ways, to form other mental states, and which is typically caused by certain things in the world. The causal thesis is sort of crucial to Lewis's kind of functionalism or causal theory of the mind. The idea is that mental states in general um, occupy a position in a kind of causal nexus between inputs and outputs and other kinds of mental states. And experiences or conscious states are no different from ordinary mental states in that sense. So a, a version of the causal thesis would be true of them. But, but uh, Lewis thinks that not only is the causal theory th thesis true, it, it too, it would be built in to folk psychology. It's part of what folk psychology says about uh, experiences. Likewise, um, Lewis would advance what he calls the ability. Um, actually, in his discussion of the knowledge argument, you have this idea of the ability hypothesis. But here I'm just calling it the ability thesis, which is that when you have an experience, you have a an ability to imagine the experience, to remember the experience, and to recognize the experience when you have it again. Um, so if you, you, know, you taste mustard, that puts you in a position to imagine the taste of mustard when it's not available, to remember the taste of mustard, and to recognize the taste of mustard again. Um, Lewis set, starts off this particular paper actually by repeating these points about abilities. And again, these things are part of what folk psychology says about the experience. He's not simply saying that it's true of experience, but he's saying that um, folk psychology says that experiences or conscious states um, uh, play this particular role or have these properties. A third one is the identification thesis that we've looked at. 
And a fourth one might be the self-intimation thesis, which says that when you have an experience, you know that you are having the experience. We've already contrasted self-intimation and revelation. Well, again, um, uh, it's, it's uh, possible that Lewis would say that self-intimation is built into folk psychology. Actually, the only discussion, explicit discussion of self-intimation that I know of in Lewis, uh, in Lewis is a kind of early paper called um, Psychophysical and Theoretical Identifications. And in that paper, he says that uh, it's a sort of an open question with a self-intimation, something like this is true. But various other s remarks he makes at various points suggest that he thinks something like this is true. But in a certain sense, it doesn't really matter whether it's true or not. The, the main point here is that um, um, uh, when Lewis says that I, the identification thesis is built in to folk psychology, he means that it's part of the content of folk psychology. And moreover, it's just one of a bunch of theses that are part of the content of folk psychology. So the idea is that, you know, what do ordinary people think about the mind or think about experiences or conscious states? Uh, Lewis says, well, among other things, they, they will hold the causal thesis, the ability thesis, the identification thesis, and the self-intimation thesis, or perhaps they will hold that. Now, Lewis not only says that these things are built into folk psychology in his paper, he's also assuming that we can appeal to these facts to give a definition of what a conscious state or what an experience is. Um, that's a further claim. I mean, one, could, one could agree with him that these things are built into folk psychology without having any view about how to define an experience or a conscious state. And we can think this, this is a sort of highly simplified way of thinking about it, but I think it gets to the basic idea. I think he thinks that something or a subject is in a conscious state, C, if and only if the subject is in a state that satisfies all or most of what folk psychology says. So you might say, what is it to be in a conscious state? Well, according to Lewis, if you go back and look at these theses, uh, what is it to have an experience or be in a conscious state? He thinks, well, to be in a conscious state or to have an experience is to be in a state that satisfies all or most of these theses, to be in a state which is such that when you're in it, you're in some inner state that typically causes you to behave in various ways. That's from the causal thesis. When you're in it, you're in, you have an ability to imagine it, to remember it, to recognize it. When you're in it, you're in, you, you know the essence of it. And when you're in it, you know that you're in it. That's roughly the self-intimation thesis. So basically, these theses give us an account, a definition of what uh, consciousness is. So that's a very sort of typical idea in Lewis's philosophy that you can uh, articulate these principles and then you can use them to define the notion that you're interested in. And here the notion is consciousness or experience. Now, the idea that you can use these things to um, define what a conscious state is raises loads of background issues about about philosophy, about philosophical methodology, and so forth. I mean, one question is just, why should the definition of consciousness conform to folk psychology, exactly? Um, you might think, well, the, to give a definition of consciousness is to give what, what philosophers sometimes call a real definition. It's to say what the essence of the thing is. And while it's true that we have, perhaps, maybe it's just a psychological fact, that uh, we have this tacit system of of belief about folk psychology, about psychology, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, consciousness conforms to that. Um, uh, why, why should we assume that? Um, another question might be, isn't Lewis here being, isn't he somehow open to empirical refutation? If he's making these claims about folk psychology, you'd think, well, these are empirical claims. We'd need to address them uh, just like we, we ordinarily address um, psychological questions. I mean, um, one wouldn't, one wouldn't try to, um, you know, one can't be too confident, for example, about how people are thinking about folk biology or folk physics. Those are empirical questions. And likewise, you'd think the question of folk psychology is an empirical question. And in fact, if you put these two questions together, it all becomes a bit puzzling because you might think, well, you wouldn't normally think that, um, um, you know, we would use folk biology to define some notion of, uh, 
so life or growth or reproduction or some notion of that sort. So why should we think that uh, consciousness should be defined in terms of folk biology? A third question is, is something like this. I mean, isn't, isn't Lewis sort of psychologizing philosophy in some sort of objectionable way? He seems to be thinking that we need to do the psychology of folk psychology to say what it is that we tacitly believe about consciousness and then use that to, um, to define what consciousness is. But, um, but that doesn't seem to be an appropriate way of proceeding. And, and, and related to the second question, it looks as if it's, his procedure here is open to empirical refutation because it looks, you know, it looks to be an empirical question what it is that we believe or not. Well, these are often questions that are put to Lewis uh, and Lewis-style philosophy, I think. Um, and I, I, they're, they're sort of natural questions. I do think he has answers to these questions. Um, and um, the, the, the answers to the questions are roughly that um, one, one needs to start with what, 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 while it's true that he's talking about um, folk psychology here, I think in a certain sense he's also just starting with what is obvious from his point of view about folks about consciousness. None of these things are, uh, could be revised, but nevertheless, that's where you have to start when you're th theorizing about consciousness. So it's not completely obvious that he's open to empirical refutation or that he's psychologizing philosophy or that he's thinking that the uh, definition of, uh, uh, of consciousness is in principle hostage to folk psychology. But certainly these questions are very natural ones to ask. There's also a fourth question, which I, I, I guess I'm going to uh, want to emphasize, and that is that you might ask whether there's one definition here or many. Notice that in this sort of formulation, we've got S is in a conscious state C, if and only if S is in a state that satisfies all or most of what folk psychology says. Well, that sort of more or less makes it explicit that um, that um, you know it could, we'd, we we could articulate different notions of consciousness here. Some that satisfy all the all of all of what folk psychology says. Some that satisfies most. But since you can satisfy most in various ways, um, it uh, it um, uh, th there are various potential definitions. And in fact, that's what um, Lewis says, so he in effect in the paper offers us two competing definitions of consciousness, one which includes revelation and one which isn't, one which doesn't, I'm sorry. And this is kind of uh, clearly on show right from the beginning of the paper, so here's how he begins the paper. Should a materialist believe in qualia? Yes and no. Qualia is a name for the occupants of a certain functional role that is spelled out in our tacitly known folk psychology. If materialism is true, there are no perfect occupants of the role and hence no perfect deservers of the name. But in all probability, there are imperfect occupants of the role, imperfect deservers of the name. Good enough deservers of the name? May they just be called qualia? I say yes, but I take this to be a case of semantic indecision. So in a certain sense, we can think of this as proposing different definitions of consciousness. If we go back to these theses that I had before, in effect what Lewis is saying is that um, if we think of a conscious state or an experience as something that satisfies um, all of these uh, all of these theses, it's something that, that makes all of these theses true, then if materialism is true, there can't be experiences. And the reason is that if materialism is true, uh, it can't be that the, that the identification thesis uh, is built into the notion of consciousness because there isn't anything that satisfies the identification thesis if materialism is true. But suppose we have an alternative definition of consciousness that takes out the identification thesis, that treats that as a kind of extraneous and not essential to the notion of consciousness then we would have a notion that, um, that is completely compatible with materialism. So, for example, if we, we had a notion of experience according to which it had to satisfy the causal thesis, the ability thesis, and perhaps, let's say, the self-intimation thesis, then we, we would find something that, as Lewis says, deserves the name. So he puts this in terms of qualia here, 
uh, and um, and he also says qualia is a name for the occupants of a certain functional role that is spelled out in our tacitly known folk psychology. What I think he means there is qualia is a name for something that satisfies the principles uh, that folk psychology is committed to. Um, and there isn't something that satisfies all of the principles, but there might be something that satisfies some of those principles or enough of those principles. And if you satisfy enough of the principles, then you're a good enough deserver of the name. Um, as I mentioned, we, we're not going to use the name qualia here, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what one calls it. Interestingly, Lewis says, I take this to be a case of semantic indecision. And what he means by that is that he thinks that the the conventions of the language or the way that we use the language here doesn't really decide. It doesn't say that, for example, the identification thesis must be built into qualia, must be built into consciousness. Um, he thinks that there's a legitimate conception, a, a conception in other words, that's consistent with our conventions of the way we use the word, which, according to which we could get rid of that notion. Um, so there's a legitimate notion according to which um, uh, something is an experience only if revelation is true. But then there's another notion according to which something is, is experience even if revelation is not true. And that's why we have this kind of yes and no quality in the paper. Um, it's a very typical feature of Lewis's philosophy that he does this about, you know, for many other cases as well, there's this question of, uh, uh, you know, is there causation? Are there colors and so forth? Are there value? And often you get this move that says, well, if materialism is true, then everything that we believe about causation or value or colors can't be true. But a lot of what we believe could be true. And that would be sufficient for us to say that there are colors or value. But if you insisted on having a definition that, that, um, that required that all of the things that we say about it are true, then we would have to claim that there are no such things. Um, okay, so all of this then is premised on the issue of, uh, of what folk psychology says. So what, um, and all of what we've been saying so far is that, um, is premised on the idea that folk psychology says that the identification thesis is true or that the identification thesis is built in to folk psychology, or that revelation, I'm sorry, is built into folk psychology. But of course, the, the, everything here turns on why it is that revelation is built into folk psychology. Why does Lewis think that? Because after all, the points that we've just looked at, um, um, the, the point that if we go back to this definition that S is a conscious state C, if and only if S is in a state that satisfies all or most, of what folk psychology says, well, uh, w whether we come out with a reasonable definition depends on it depends entirely on what folk psychology says, and we can imagine that it says lots of different things. We could imagine, for example, that it says that you know that conscious states are essentially non-physical. That might be a part of what folk psychology says, and then if that were the case, then of course. Um, um, we would have a legitimate definition of a folk psychological of a, of a conscious state, which wouldn't be consistent with materialism. So uh, um, everything, in a certain sense, depends on what folk psychology says, in fact, and whether indeed it says that revelation is true. So why does Lewis think that revelation is true? Well, he answers this early on in the paper uh, very clearly. He says, "Why do I think it must be part?" of the folk theory of qualia. Why do I think, in other words, that, that revelation uh, is part of the folk theory of qualia? And his answer is, because so many philosophers find it so very obvious. That's why. I think it, and then he says, I think it seems obvious because it is built into folk psychology. Others will think it gets built into folk psychology because it is so obvious. But either way, the obviousness and the folk psychological status go together. So there's this interesting issue here about whether something is obvious because it is built into folk psychology or whether it's built into folk psychology because it is obvious. He says the first. He says it's obvious because it is built into folk psychology. I think what's going on here is that um, Lewis thinks that these principles which are sort of tacitly known 
may be in some ways quite unobvious t to us. In, so, in some ways, in some parts of his work, he compares our tacit understanding of folk psychology with our tacit understanding of grammatical rules, for example. And they may be extremely unobvious to us um, in a certain sense, even though we would tacitly know them. So he doesn't think that, um, that it's... Um, but w w what he wants to say is that in principle something could be tacitly known and quite unobvious. But in this case, because it's tacitly known, it seems obvious to us, I think. Um, in any case, as he says, the obviousness and the folk psychological status go together. Um, notice here that there's this funny thing, uh, f funny other feature of this passage. He says, because so many philosophers find it so very obvious. Why do I think it must be part of the folk theory of qualia? Because so many philosophers find it so very obvious. Okay, that's a very strange thing to say, actually, because um, he's assuming, at least in this passage, that uh, philosophers are a kind of characteristic or sort of no, a representative sample of ordinary people. So the idea is that, well, we've got philosophers who think it's obvious, and therefore it's built into folk psychology. That's somewhat of an, a strange inference, because you might think, well, there are these very distinctive cultural effects in psychology, and so it wouldn't be surprising that philosophers find things obvious, even if ordinary people don't. And um, you might think this is somewhat of a small point, but actually I think it's quite an important point, because it's, it, it is quite important in Lewis's project here to think of revelation as built into folk psychology as part of ordinary thought, and not so much a kind of philosophical imposition on ordinary thought. In other parts of his work, he, he sometimes talks as if revelation or something analogous is a sort of um, uh, mistaken interpretation of ordinary thought rather than something that's built in to ordinary thought. But here he thinks it's, it's built into ordinary thought, but the crucial thing is that his evidence for supposing that is that philosophers find it so obvious. And you might ask whether that, even if that were true, whether it would show that... Um, um, that, uh, that, it's, that it's built into ordinary thought about it, about, um, about qualia. Well, but even then we might ask, well, what is the, what is the, what is the data that, wh 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 what is the reason for thinking that philosophers find it so obvious? And here Lewis says a remarkable thing. He says, Kripke seems to be relying on the identification thesis. In other words, he's relying on revelation in Naming a Necessity, when he writes that pain is picked out by its immediate phenomenological quality. So the basic idea is that, that um, revelation is built into folk psychology, and our evidence for that is that philosophers find it obvious, and the philosopher who's, who finds it obvious, or at least one of the main philosophers who finds it obvious, or at least seems to, is Kripke. Now here I think we, it's worthwhile looking at the Kripke passage to see if it's really true that, um, that he's relying on revelation in the identification thesis. You remember last time I looked at the conceivability argument and suggested that, in fact, that argument doesn't presuppose uh, revelation. And in the parts of Naming and Necessity where he writes, where Kripke writes, that pain is picked out by its immediate phenomenological quality, that's from Lecture 3 of Naming and, uh, of Naming and Necessity. And... Um, that's the lecture where Kripke is really defending. He doesn't use the word conceivability argument, but he's defending, um, he's defending an argument that is recognizably like a conceivability argument. And so when, when Lewis says that Kripke seems to be relying on revelation here, he seems to be saying that in that bit, in that conceivability argument, or at least something that's analogous to the conceivability argument, Kripke's relying on revelation. Well, let's see if that's true. Well, let's have a look at the Kripke passage, the full passage. So here's the famous Kripke passage where he does say that um, pain is picked out by its immediate phenomenological quality. And the, the full passage is one in which Kripke is comparing heat and pain. Heat is a, um, a property of physical objects and um, uh, pain is a property of of subjects like us, and what in, in the context, what Kripke is doing is pointing out that um, 
what we would now think of as conceivability arguments about about heat uh, um, are not uh, are not are not plausible. But what we might think of as conceivability arguments about pain are quite plausible. And here's what he says: in the case of the identity of heat with molecular motion, uh, the important consideration was that although heat is a rigid designator the reference of that designator was determined by an accidental property of the referent, namely the property of producing in us the sensation S. It's thus possible that a phenomenon should have been rigidly designated in the same way as the phenomenon as heat, with its reference also picked out by means of the sensation S, without that phenomenon being heat, and therefore its being molecular motion. Pain, on the other hand, is not picked out by one of its accidental properties. Rather, it's picked out by the property of being pain itself, by its immediate phenomenological quality. That's the thing that Lewis fo focuses on. Thus, pain, unlike heat, is not only rigidly designated by the word pain, but the reference of the designator is determined by an essential property of the referent. So what Lewis says is that in this passage, Kripke is relying on revelation and the identification thesis. Now, on the face of it, I think that's an interpretive, that's a strange thing to say interpretively. There doesn't seem to be any obvious reason that Kripke is relying on uh, revelation here. And one, one way to, to, to bring that out is to notice that, first of all, I mean, the first thing you might say is that, that, that Kripke here is talking about language. He's talking about um, uh, the word heat being a rigid designator and how it gets to denote the thing that it does denote, namely the heat, heat in an object or molecular motion, since heat is assumed to be identical with molecular motion. And he's saying that the word heat picks out that thing because of an accidental property of the referent. And then he says in the case of pain, in contrast, the word pain picks out what it denotes, namely pain, not by an accidental property of the referent, but by pain itself. But that seems to be a thesis about language. Um, it's not really a thesis about knowledge at all, but whatever the identification thesis is, or whatever revelation is, it's got to be a thesis about knowledge. That's the whole point. The whole point is that if you're in pain, you know the essence of pain, or at least something along those lines. And it's not a thesis about language at all. So it's extremely puzzling that Lewis says that, that Kripke is relying on uh, revelation in this passage, since he seems to be talking about language. Now, you might say, well, OK, but that's a pretty superficial way of taking it. It's, it's, it's true that he's sort of talking about language, but in the background is a thesis about knowledge, and that may well be a, a claim about revelation or a, cl a claim that, that sometimes somehow gets you in the, the, uh, the vicinity of the revelation thesis. But I think even if, but I, I mean, I agree with that, but I think even if we interpret Kripke as talking about knowledge, then it's still hard to see why he's talking about revelation. And the reason for that is that he, he, he seems to be drawing a distinction here between knowing what heat is on the one hand and knowing what pain is on the other. And so in particular, he seems to be saying, if we, if we transpose what he says so that it, he's, um, he's talking about knowledge, or we interpret him so that he's talking about knowledge, then he seems to be saying that when you know what heat is, you know something de dicto about heat. You know, for example, that heat is the cause of heat sensations. And the cause of heat sensations is it's a, it's a contingent fact about heat, that it's the cause of heat sensations. Molecular commotion, namely heat, does in fact cause heat sensations, but it might not have caused heat sensations had circumstances been different. But what he's suggesting is that to know what heat is, is to know that it's the cause of heat sensations. It's to know, um, um, it's to know some contingent fact about heat. But to, to know, but in contrast, to know what pain is, is not to know some de dicto claim like that pain is the cause of pain sensations, because that doesn't really make any sense, because pain just is a pain sensation. We can't draw the distinction between 
pain and pain sensation as we can draw between heat and heat sensation. So what is it to know what pain is? Well, it looks plausible as, plausibly as if what Kripke is saying here is that to know of some state is to know of some state, picked out by pain itself, to know of some state, which is pain, that it is pain. It's to know, if you like, that this is pain. This here, the, the demonstrative, picks out pain itself. It would normally be thought that a, a construction like, I know that this is pain, reports a case of de re knowledge. This is such that I know that it is pain. So I know of some state that it's pain. But that's to be contrasted with de dicto knowledge, where you know that such and such is the case. You know that heat is the cause of heat sensations and so forth. So I think if we go back to this Kripke passage and we ask, well, is he talking about revelation? The initial thing to say is that, well, he's talking about language. He's not talking about knowledge at all. So why should he be talking about revelation? But even if we take him to be talking about knowledge, uh, and it's not totally obvious that he is talking about knowledge, but if we take him to be talking about knowledge, he seems to be contrasting what it knowing what heat is on the one hand and knowing what pain is on the other and the contrast seems to be that when you know what heat is you know that heat is the cause of heat sensations or you know that heat has some accidental property whereas when you know what pain is um, you know that this is pain which is a case of day which is a day ray kind of knowledge you know of this thing that it is a pain so that's the contrast that Kripke seems to be emphasizing in this passage. But the point is that revelation isn't a case of knowledge de re. Revelation is not a case of knowledge de re at all of the kind that Kripke is, is talking about here, or at least appears to be talking about. And to see that, let's look again at the thesis of revelation. So remember that thesis is necessarily, if you're in a conscious state C, you'll know that C is F so long as you are psychologically capable of believing that C is F and so long as you are rational. So here notice it's you know that C is F. That's a piece of de, ra, de dicto knowledge. But we can contrast that with, you like, with a case of um, a kind of de re version of revelation. Necessarily, if you're in a conscious state, you'll know of some state which is in fact F, which, is in, f which in fact has that essence, perhaps unbeknownst to you, that it is uh, that it is the state it is, so long as you are psychologically capable and so forth. Now, the thing is that, it's that, that, that revelation is the first thesis, not the second thesis. You have to know that, um, that, um, that the conscious state, um, you have to know that the conscious state has the essence. It's not just that you know of some state which has an essence, that it is the conscious state that it is. That isn't a kind of revelation. So when Kripke is talking here about de re knowledge, he clearly isn't talking about revelation. And the curious fact is that Lewis agrees with this at the end of his paper. He doesn't talk about Kripke, but he agrees that knowledge de re isn't revelation, properly speaking, isn't the identification thesis. And so he says, I may know de re of Fred, that he is a burglar, without in any sense identifying Fred, knowing in this case who Fred is in the sense of knowing his essence. Likewise, I may know de re of a certain physical property that it, that it is among the qualia of my experience without identifying the property in question. Now here he's talking about a physical property and Kripke, I think, wouldn't think that you could identify a physical property um, as, uh, as your pain. But it need, that, that, that is a sort of inessential feature of the situation. I think the, the crucial point is that Lewis says, in fact, that knowing of something that it is a pain would be a case of de re knowledge, and that is not revelation, strictly speaking. But if that's the case, then it's hard to see that Kripke is relying on revelation in this particular passage, because he seems to be saying that we have a certain kind of de re knowledge. Uh, well, at least to know what pain is involves a certain kind of de re knowledge, not a kind of de dicto knowledge which might be involved in the case of knowing what heat is. Okay, so my conclusion then is that Kripke uh, uh, doesn't rely on revelation in that passage. He's talking about knowledge de re, not knowledge de dicto, and knowledge de dicto is what's required for revelation. 
And if that's the case, I think we lose Lewis's stated reason for thinking that revelation is presupposed by philosophers, or at least we lose his stated reason for thinking that revelation is pro presupposed by that particular philosopher, and that's, that's a pretty prominent example of the kind of philosopher that he has in mind. And as we noted, Lewis thinks that it's presupposed in folk psychology, or it's built into folk psychology. In other words, ordinary people are committed to this in some sense, because philosophers find it so obvious. But um, if, if the evidence for that is that Kripke finds it obvious, then, um, then that doesn't seem to be a very persuasive line of argument. Um, at the beginning of the previous lecture, I asked you to reflect on a passage from Philip Goff, and, and Philip thinks of that as a, you know, he, he sort of sets out what revelation is and thinks, asks you to reflect on it and thinks that it's obviously true. I think one of the things that we've discovered here is that all of these theses are sort of much more difficult to pin down than, than you might think. And the claim that, you know, lots of people are relying on revelation just doesn't seem to be true when you look at it critically. And I don't think in particular that Kripke is uh, relying on it in that passage. Well, does he rely on other ideas, you might ask, about introspection in naming and necessity? Well, it's often said, actually, that he, that he denies an appearance-reality distinction. In Dave Chalmers's meta-problem paper, he talks of, um, you know, the Kripkean... Uh, it may, it's either that paper or in some responses to that paper. He, he, he talks of the Kripkean denial of the appearance-reality distinction. Well, I'm not sure that Kripke does, in fact, deny the appearance-reality distinction, but I'm not going to turn to that. In fact, I'm going to, I'm not going to take up the question of whether Kripke does, but I will take up the issue of uh, the whole general issue of appearance and reality in the context of introspection uh, next time. So that's what we're going to do then. So I will talk to you guys.